Greetings, everyone. My name is Bridget Cabrera, she, her, hers, and I'm the Executive Director of Methodist Federation for Social Action. MFSA is over 100 years old, and our mission is to mobilize, lead, and sustain a progressive United Methodist movement, energizing people to be God's agents of justice, peace, and reconciliation. And we're so excited to be co-hosting this series of webinars with our partner, United Methodists for Kairos Response, UMKR. A few announcements concerning our conversation today. Um, we invite you to please continue to keep yourselves on mute um, during the conversation. This will help with everyone's ability to hear each other and in particular to see our speakers. Our webinars are a place to learn, engage, and be in community together. In order to create an equitable and brave space, we do not tolerate any hate speech on our conversations. We are recording the webinar and that recording will be shared in the coming days. You can access that either through UMKR or MFSA on either of our um, YouTube channels or our websites. And as you have questions, you don't have to wait to the end of the webinar or for a particular Q&A portion to type those in. As you're thinking of your questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box. And we ask that you refer those questions to John Wagner, who's gonna be helping us get those questions um, to our moderator. Now closed captioning is automatically generated. So do expect to see spelling errors and other errors as that is just a computer putting all that stuff up. So thank you for being here and um, we welcome John Wagner. Well, I'm John Wagner. I'm a, a co-chair along with Lisa Bender of United Methodist for Kairos Response. Uh, we have been around for about 10 years. We are engaged in uh, nonviolent actions like divestment and boycott and many other activities to support um, Palestinian Christians who have called us to action in this country and around the world for peace and justice. So that's our mission, and we're so glad to have you with us. Um, there will be contact information posted in the chat for uh, UMKR, so you can get in touch with us, as well as the Methodist Federation for Social Action. Uh, I would like to introduce now our moderator for this webinar, Teresa Basile, she's one of the founders of United Methodist for Kairos Response, uh, has been with us the whole time as our communications director, is also on the board of um, uh, Friends of Sabil North America, FASNA, you'll hear a little bit more about that later, and uh, has been active in this area for many, many years. So I'll introduce Teresa now. Thanks, John. And uh, it's great to see everyone here. Thank you for attending, and especially thank you to our, uh, our wonderful panelists for giving their time and joining us here today. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from them shortly, but first I'd like to uh, introduce the subject of this webinar. Uh, on October 19th of 2021, six highly respected Palestinian organizations were designated by Israel as terrorist organizations. The Israeli government claimed that the groups had tie to the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and were channeling money to that group. It's a group that Israel considers to be a terrorist organization. Initially, Israel said the designation would not apply in the occupied territories, only in Israel, but I think it was in November they expanded that. They issued a military order for the West Bank with the same declaration about these six groups. This is a very dis dangerous situation. This designation uh, could have terrible consequences for these groups, especially in light of the drastic counterterrorism legislation that Israel adopted in 2016. And also, of course, uh, in light of what that terrorist designation would mean to governments around the world if they believe Israel. Uh, let me tell you about the six groups, very briefly, all six of them uh, that have been designated in this unprecedented way. al haq is one of the oldest and most prominent human rights organizations in the Middle East. 
They have notably provided crucial information for the ICC, the International Criminal Court, to enable them to start investigations of possible war crimes and crimes against humanity by Israel. Uh, Adamir was founded 30 years ago and is one of the leading prisoner advocacy organizations in Palestine. They provide legal and advocacy support to Palestinian political prisoners in both Israeli and Palestinian prisons. Defense for Children International Palestine, GCIP, is an independent Palestinian child rights organization dedicated to defending and promoting the rights of children living in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. DCIP documents and exposes grave human rights violations against children, provides legal aid, and advocates on their behalf. Those are probably the three groups that many advocates around the world know best. There are three more that have been under attack that also do absolutely vital work. Uh, one of those is the Union of Agricultural Working Committees. They support Palestinian farmers and rural communities in Area C in the West Bank, which covers 60% of the West Bank, and it remains under full Israeli control. And Israel is trying to maintain as much control over that territory as they can. The UAWC supports Palestinians struggle to remain on their land and resist Israeli home demolitions and forced displacement. The Bissan Center for Research and Development is a progressive civil society organization that seeks to enhance Palestinians' resilience and to contribute in building an effective democratic society. The center aligns itself with the poor and the marginalized in their struggles to achieve their rights in the context of national liberation for Palestine. The Union of Palestinian Women's Committees is a feminist progressive organization striving to build a progressive democratic society without any form of discrimination and with justice for all. So those are six extraordinary groups. Uh, I will soon have a question for our speakers, but now let me tell you about them. Sahar Francis has been the general director of Adamir Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association since 2006. She is an attorney by training and she joined the association in 1998, first as a human rights lawyer, then as head of the legal unit. She has over 16 years of human rights experience, including human rights counseling and representation. She has served on the board of Defense for Children International Palestine, and she currently sits on the board of the Union of Agricultural Work Committees. I think it's noteworthy that I just named three of the six organizations there, so I think Sahar may have the unique distinction of having worked for three of these six groups. Uh, Jonathan Kutab is a co-founder of the Palestinian Human Rights Organization, AHAC, which is one of these six groups, and also of Nonviolence International. He is an international human rights attorney practicing in the US, Palestine, and Israel. He headed the legal committee, negotiating the Cairo Agreement of 1994 between Israel and the PLO. After he received his JD at Virginia Law School, Jonathan practiced for a couple of years in New York and then returned home to Palestine and became a resident of East Jerusalem. Today, he serves as executive director of Friends of Seville North America, FOSNA. Brad Parker is senior advisor for policy and advocacy at Defense for Children International Palestine, DCIT. He specializes in issues of juvenile justice and grave violations against children during armed conflict and leads DCIP's legal ad advocacy efforts on Palestinian children's rights. He also co-leads DCIP's No Way to Treat a Child campaign along with AFSC. Before joining DCIP, Brad worked as a legal advocacy coordinator and staff attorney at MADRE, an international women's rights organization. So once again, welcome to all of you. Thank you again for being with us on our panel to help us better understand Israel's attack on these six organizations and to put it in the context, the broader context of Israel's lawfare campaign against Palestinian civil society. So my first question for you is this. We, we know there are hundreds of NGOs you know, throughout pal historic Palestine uh, doing all sorts of admirable work and much of it work that Israel would not be in favor of. Why, why these six organizations? Why is, has Israel mounted this rather ferocious attack on these six groups? 
So, Har, I'm going to put that to you first, and then our other two panelists can follow you. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and thanks for this great opportunity uh, to be with you uh, tonight. And I should highlight, as you said in your uh, introduction, it, it seems like the six, but actually we should take in consideration the Israeli practice against the Palestinian civil society is not a, a short time policy, but it started as old as the occupation itself. And there's a very, uh, um, a good connection to the political context. I should remind ourselves with the attack against the Palestinian NGOs in the 90s after the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, for example, in East Jerusalem, where Israel insisted to force that there's no presence for the PA, no matter what, in this uh, side of the city, and they closed the Orient House they closed the Domir office and the DCI office that we were initiated in the 90s as NGOs based in East Jerusalem, registered under the Israeli law at that time, and they kicked us out of the, uh, of the city. And this attack against the uh, uh, civil society takes different forms. As I said, depends on the uh, context on the ground and much of what's going on uh, the fight, the resistance that the uh, civil society is leading. So what happened in the last uh, couple of years, there were a smear campaign led by Israeli uh, uh, right-wing uh, NGOs like the NGO Monitor, the UK Lawyers for Israel, Imter Tzu, Shurat Hadin, and lots of other groups that they were looking into what these human rights and humanitarian aid and the Palestinian civil society organizations are doing, especially on the changing on the international level about our language, about our demands on uh, the level of accountability, the kind of work we are involved in, the campaigns we are doing, the boycott, divestment and sanction campaign, the fact that we approach the ICC, and so on. This is what made the difference. And they started to attack us and uh, distribute false information about us. And uh, uh, they wanted to dry our resources. When they failed with all these efforts, they came to uh, uh, try the legal uh, uh, use of the Israeli anti-terror law of 2016. And it happened that they claim, as they claim, they have now more evidences. These evidences actually is about confessions that were gathered by uh, Palestinian detainees and their interrogation. And it's a long story about how interrogation is implemented in the Israeli detention facilities. And it should be also highlighted that it will not stop here. So part of it is definitely related to our daily work in, as you described, in uh, protecting farmers in Area C, uh, uh, launching cases to the ICC, defending children and reaching the Congress in order to affect policymakers and so on. And it will continue. It will continue against other uh, civil society organizations if they are threatening the interest of the Israeli state. Thank you. Um, Brad, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just a, a, a brief comment. And also just to say thanks for, for having me. Um, and also to note that it's it's pretty ambitious to invite three lawyers for a one hour webinar. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll do our best. Um, I, I, I think on this question, you know, why these six organizations, the point that Sahar made that this is, you know, there's really nothing new, right? It's, it's sort of that this is gotten more attention sort of in the, the context that it landed and I think the ability um, in the networks that the organizations are connected to um, to, to push back um, you know several months before the designations came against DCI Palestine uh, Ademir al Haq and, and others um, health work committees was was in the crosshairs um, civic institutions in East Jerusalem were in the crosshairs before that so um, it is sort of an ongoing attack against Palestinian civil society. Um, I think for us, we saw 
sort of a significant targeted escalation against DCI Palestine starting um, back in 2017 after we you know had some um, success with congressional advocacy, particularly in the US. Uh, you know, I know I've worked with Sahar and Adamir um, uh, on, on international criminal court uh, advocacy over the years and, and engagement there as well with Al Haq. Um, and I think it's the, the, the rising international awareness of ongoing Israeli crimes and sort of a shifting political um, context in, in multiple locations, including in the US, where, mm -hmm. you know, APAC, which used to be a very bipartisan um, kind of unchallenged entity, is now very much a GOP aligned um, partisan outfit where there's been a lot of shifting, I think, under the surface of uh, the political framework, not just in the US, but elsewhere, that then sort of leads to these escalations. Um, you know, we, we've had significant threats to us from private actors. And as the Israeli government has become increasingly right wing, <laughs> you see those private actors that, that uh, those things that have been happening start to meld and sort of just become part of the government positions and the government attack. So um, as, as, as we continue our efforts to expose crimes and hold individuals accountable, right, the, the attacks and the seriousness of the attacks have escalated side by side those efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jonathan, I'm gonna ask you if you wanna chime in. I, I kinda wanna sum up what I think I heard that, um, in some ways, my fr my question was framed poorly because actually there are many other groups that also are, have been targeted and for many years. But also, you these six organizations are doing a particularly good job of bringing um, the world information about the human rights violations. Um, and I I'm guessing that you've been particularly powerful in your work and have earned the particular ire and attention of Israel for that reason. Um, Jonathan. You... Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, one simple thing is that uh, Israel likes to do things legally, which means that they will pass a law which gives great uh, power to uh, the government and then leave that law on the book. And they don't implement it, obviously, because under military orders existing today, almost any political activity in the West Bank or any public activity or almost any uh, contact with any Palestinian official, uh, you have to remember that the Palestinian Authority itself is composed of all these terrorist organizations. Uh, that designation has never been removed. Uh, so, but they just leave it on the books and they use it when and if they need. Uh, the second thing that I, I point that I wanna make is that Israel feels that it has basically won. It has won at every level. The only thing it has to worry about now are these pesty civil society organizations that, that keep raising things like human rights and international law and uh, public opinion. And uh, so we go after them. Right now, the only battle that Israel feels it has to, to fight is the PR battle uh, and, and, and that is being led by civil society, whether mm -hmm. it's in the occupied territories or in the outside world. So if the outside world is using BDS, even though it's clearly a nonviolent uh, tactic, then we go after them and we criminalize it and we make it anti-Semitic and we pass a new definition, the IHRA uh, definition of what anti-Semitism is and, and make it illegal, make it criminal. Uh, uh, we delegitimize those who are trying to expose us and delegitimize what we are doing. Uh, so, so expect more, not less, of this type of activity as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, somewhere in there, that raised the question for me of the evidence against these groups, that what Israel claims it has in the way of evidence uh, to prove any kind of uh, tied to a terrorist organization or funding to it. Um, and there have been more than one demand, I think, by the six organizations individually or, or collectively to see that evidence and Israel's refusing to show it. Um, there have been news reports by people who have, 
who have had some access to it, um, saying that it's um, it's very weak, um, weak sources, and uh, but we don't know a lot of details about it. And I'm wondering what you all can tell us that you know about the evidence and your view of it. Um, yeah, anything you can share with us about this so-called evidence would be great. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna call on Brad to get us started. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. And I can pass to Sahara after here. Um, I, I, I can be brief. I mean, I think the, the bulk of the, you know, so-called evidence uh, is NGO monitor reporting um, and uh, sort of over the years that's become branded uh, by the Israeli government uh, through the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is now uh, sort of part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, right, so it's it's <laughs> those allegations that we've been dealing with and that disinformation that's been created by NGO Monitor and others, right, is I think, still sort of the foundational pieces of it. Um, and, and what's changed is that there's, government sort of stamp of approval on that and, and you know, some additional pieces that have been brought in um, from forced confessions and, um, you know, testimony that looks credible uh, from sort of a, a far gaze. But once you sort of investigate and look at it more closely, really it, it all falls apart. And I think that's, that's what we've seen over the past um, you know, eight, nine, ten months as uh, this effort escalated with European governments uh, over last summer, uh, we're working to delegitimize and discredit our work. Uh, you know, overwhelmingly, European governments found uh, the, the so-called evidence just not credible, um, and and I think that's still the case. Uh, I think on the evidence, right? <laughs> the the problem is. Um, the more that the the evidence uh, you know that's being peddled around the moment isn't received to achieve the ultimate impact of having um, financial institutions, donor governments, etc., uh, stop funding. Right? I think that the concern is that well, Israel can use the powers of the state to essentially not need evidence, uh, just detain, arrest, torture get confessions, and we've already seen this in, in certain cases um, where, where that's the norm, uh, administrative detention, right? right? It's another tool that Israel uses to essentially create a fact that seems more likely that somebody is engaged in something unlawful, uh, right? To, to sort of create facts that then they can use to enhance the, the so-called evidence they have. So I think those are the concerns. Um, Kind of where things go forward, but the core of the evidence is 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 very very weak and um, really has been discredited over and over. Great, thanks, Brad. And you got into some of what my next question was going to be, so I'm going to segue into that as I go to Jonathan. Um, the history of this campaign against your groups and others, not just what happened in October. You talked about uh, Brad talked about. Um, cases that were brought in Europe, charges that were brought and um, investigated and found to be unwarranted um, by European entities, governments or other agencies. Um, but there's been a lot of other types of harassment that have happened. And I'd like to hear from all of you about that. Um, uh, raids and uh, personal harassment of personnel. Um, but first, Jonathan, can you speak to the larger picture of this um, the history of these kinds of campaigns of lawfare. Yes, uh, at Al Haq, we've had uh, a number of our uh, members and employees, especially the field workers, as well as the executive director of the organization, at one time or another uh, denied travel uh, or uh, was arrested administratively. Never any actual charges or military court, uh, uh, but there is some kind of uh, secret evidence that they have some relation with one or another of the different uh, Palestinian factions, all of which, as I mentioned before, uh, are supposed to be illegal. 
Uh, and, and what happens in an administrative detention, actually, there is a procedure for challenging it, but, but it's such a total kangaroo court uh, because there is no charges and there's no evidence. And, and you can challenge it and then you says, what do you have to say? Or what, what can I say? I'm innocent, I've done nothing. Uh, what, are, what are you charging me with? Says, well, we, we can't tell you that, that's secret. What are the charges? What is the evidence? What are the arguments? Are, are, are all in secret. Uh, you can challenge it, but your challenge is meaningless. I understand that recently uh, the over 500 administrative detainees now have, have decided they will no longer uh, participate in this charade. Uh, what they have done instead, they've used uh, hunger strikes, which is like, I'm not going to eat until you let me out or until you try me and tell me why I am in jail. And, and of course, we've had heroic, heroic uh, efforts by people to uh, demand that they be charged and tried or released. And the last uh, person, uh, Abu Hawash, uh, 141 days. He lost half of his body weight. Uh, I don't think he will ever be uh, whole again. Uh, it's, it's so painful to look at something like that. Uh, and, and you must understand, this is not just a number of organizations or individuals. This is an entire society that is living subject to administrative measures, whether it's deportation, administrative detention, house demolitions, travel restrictions. Uh, all of these uh, can be applied arbitrarily against any person. Uh, and there is really basically no due process and no recourse. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that larger framework. That was really helpful. Um, I'd like to find out now from, um, especially from Sahar and Brad, and also uh, what you, any of you can say about the other groups that aren't represented here. Um, what have been the repercussions, the concrete uh, reactions you've gotten from around the world, both positive and negative? Um, I guess, It'd be great. Maybe start with the negative and you can close with any positive responses you've been getting. Uh, Sahar, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think the only negative uh, reaction so far was in the case of the agriculture work committees, union of agriculture work committees that the Dutch government decided to uh, suspend the special uh, uh, security company in this case uh, concluded that all these allegations of many I think the reaction uh, especially on the level of the international uh, uh, UN different groups, the uh, uh, political side, uh, lots of other governments, they were all supportive. And especially uh, after receiving the dossier, the secret dossier that the Israeli government uh, uh, represented, and they were saying that it's not sufficient evidences and they decided to continue to support. But the, oh, the problem here, and it should be highlighted how long these governments, including the United States, would uh, 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 wait for another information or another proof from the Israeli side before actually taking a very clear position telling the Israeli government this is not accurate, not sufficient. We are not going to respect your decisions and we are not going to stop coordinating, supporting and funding these organizations. And maybe just to end in a very important uh, um, point about the jurisdiction, we are all not discussing the point who said if there's any proof or allegation of misuse of fund for a Palestinian organization that is registered under the Palestinian Authority, 
that the jurisdiction should be for the Israeli security and the Israeli military court in investigating such cases. If there's any allegations for mismanagement or misuse of fund of these organizations or any of the civil society organizations, it should be dealt with the Palestinian law under the Palestinian Interior Ministry and not the responsibility of the Israelis. So the whole point uh, actually that the Israeli occupation is trying to build a case where it would be a president as well in order to be used against all those that they criticize Israel or they're trying to seek accountability in the international level, especially on the ICC or via PDS or other peaceful tools that we were developing in the last decade. Excellent, thank you. Um, Brad or Jonathan, um, anything more about the responses you've got in, from around the world? Ne negative or positive? I'd say that I think, yeah, I think on the positive side that the overwhelming solidarity and you know the, the reaction initially by folks that like this is politicized, this is targeting legitimate lawful human rights work um, and humanitarian work. Um, I, you know, I think <laughs> we've been dealing with these allegations and, and sort of all of this disinformation and uh, for so many years that, mm. you, you know, the, the significance, I think, is lost a bit. Um, I remember the day the, the designations became public. Um, we were renovating our house and I was driving uh, to southern Vermont to, to pick out some tile, <laughs> the different things. And as everything is sort of flooding in, just the, re the, the you know, thinking like, this is ridiculous. This is crazy. How is this possible? Mm -hmm. um, and then <laughs> it sort of settled in as you start getting phone calls from folks. But there was a really positive reaction. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the staffers in Congress and, and members of Congress themselves, you know, reached out to say, like, what's happening? How are you? How's everybody on the ground in Palestine? Like, what do you need from us? Um, so I think the, the testament to, you know, the relationships and the, the impact of the work that our organizations do, um, that's really what's seen by people. Um, and then the, the, the repressive tactics to silence and eliminate that work, right, are very clear. Like it's, 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 it's what an authoritarian regime would do. And that's exactly kind of what we confront in our work uh, in the Israeli authorities. Um, so I think it's been in the short term, that's been uh, a really significant uh, push. And I think Jonathan has been saying this before we started to some degree that, you know, I think that response helps to pause, you know, the escalations that are likely to come. Um, but that's where the international solidarity and sort of pushback and, and really standing by the organizations and Palestinian civil society more broadly um, is, is hugely important and significant because I think that's going to be the thing that determines, you know, how much harm comes of this, um, maybe solely um, beyond kind of <laughs> what governments do or not. I think it's, it's really comes down to what people are willing to, to step up and speak out on and push back on. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to move to another question, if that's okay, Jonathan. Um, one thing I'm wondering very specifically is it, Israel made it clear, um, they were pretty transparent about this, that one of their biggest purposes in doing this was to limit funding, um, to make it very difficult for your organizations to keep your flow of funding coming in internationally. Um, some people have the perception you're doing just fine, and you're, you're just full steam ahead with all of your work. Is that true? Um, is your work being hurt by this? Uh, has your funding been hurt? Any, any, any practical no, repercussions for you? Not so far, but there's a very realistic possibility that Israel may order the Palestinian banks to freeze the accounts, that they may physically come in and confiscate the equipment, uh, like they did with DCI uh, uh, before they announced these six uh, meetings. They simply just came in and uh, uh, trashed their uh, headquarters and took out their, uh, uh, their, their computer equipment. Uh, 
but they can do that, I think, and and uh, they would have done that if there wasn't this tremendous international outcry. Mm. Uh, I, I think this the, the importance of international solidarity cannot be overestimated. Uh, I think uh, everybody on this call, I think, are contributing to making it harder for Israel to take specific actions against these six organizations, at least for the time being. Uh, and, and we have to be careful. We have to know that this may change very quickly uh, once that level of interest and support uh, falls uh, down, then they will uh, move ahead against all these organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, Sahar, can you share also uh, in practical terms what has been the impact of this on your on your on Ademir's work? I totally agree with Jonathan about what he said. The worst is to come. We we like the whole solidarity campaign maybe caused that they are not raiding uh, physically our offices and freezing our accounts and so on. But specifically on the Bomir uh, level and uh, for BIT as well for DCI, our legal programs, our legal representation, uh, representing detainees and prisoners in the military courts and the civil courts and the visitation program to the detention centers and prisons were affected because lawyers are not able anymore. Actually, they're continuing their work as private lawyers, but not as representatives of Dhamir, because by itself, it would be a crime act according to the Israeli military orders and the uh, uh, Israeli anti-terror law by supporting illegal entity and a terrorist group. So for some point, it started to affect the uh, physical work in the case uh, in the case of other organizations like I said OAC that they do offer services for farmers uh, mm -hmm. uh, they would be more affected as well and not being able to freely uh, access area C and uh, 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 like uh, hotspot uh, areas as they used to be before, but we're expecting that this is could be more deteriorating in the coming uh, few months if really the pressure is not uh, uh, leading to the revocation of the uh, decisions mm -hmm. and canceling totally the orders. So the worst is yet to come is what I'm hearing both of you say. And Brad, do you want to add to that? What has the impact been on DCIP? Well, I think it's consistent with, with what Postahar and Jonathan said. The you know the 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 tangible concrete impacts like we haven't seen them yet. Um, but the the possibility that banks bank accounts could be um seized frozen right it, office could be closed um, all of that could happen at any moment essentially um and i think the the impact so far while they haven't been drastic and, and, and damaging you know it does take a toll um you know uh, with with my colleagues in palestine the the fact that they work with a designated organization now under israeli and military law um all of this is a concern um People have families, <laughs> kids, um, homes, all of these things that everybody has all over the world that um, they rely on that paycheck and job to, to help provide. Um, so the, the uncertainty I think is um, all part of it. Uh, it. It's what's meant to chill relationships that we have internationally. Uh, and it's also you know meant to, to sort of put some doubt and chill relationships internally um, with the organizations. And, and I think we're seeing that play out in the short term um, with, you know, we'd be naive to think that that an escalation isn't going to come at some point um, if we're able to weather the, the storm that we're in now. Thank you. Um, well, that brings me to what I thought would be my last question, but I'm going to go into this now, and then we can look at a bigger picture um, of lawfare. Uh, I'm really wondering, what do you need in the short term and the long term, need from us? Uh, I think most of the people here and a lot of other people around the world need and want a way to be of help. And um, 
One of the ways that some of us have started doing it is with um, political actions, uh, petitions to the heads of government uh, in, in the, here in the US, the president, the secretary of state, um, contacting our members of Congress, asking them to speak out. We even have a piece of legislation, House Resolution 751, introduced by Betty McCollum, uh, denouncing this action by Israel, um, has a few sponsors. US government certainly hasn't spoken out in any strong way. Uh, they've been basically silent. And although the European Union, I think, has affirmed its support for Palestinian civil society, none, no individual European government has come out uh, in opposition to what Israel's done. And so what, what more can we do? What do you think of those political actions we've started? And what else can we do to make a change in this situation for you? Um, yep, Sahar, I'll shoot that to you. I think it's a very, um, um, like very needed efforts, what you just described, and it should be expanded more and more, and we should keep the pressure. The pressure on the political level is very essential because we, as six organizations, we know that we have nothing to look into the legal uh, procedures internally on the Israeli system whether in the civil system or in the military court system like appeal and petitioning the high court. I don't, uh, I'm not so optimistic that we can cause canceling these orders by exhausting the internal remedies. And this is why it's very, very important the political pressure on the international level. So keep your campaign uh, uh, and intensify it uh, with the Congress, with the State Department, and every side that you think in the uh, United States can make difference. And I think we should start thinking about the ways how we can influence as well the bank, the banking system decision making, because this is would be very dangerous and very threatening. In the future, even if states don't take positions, I'm afraid that the banks would start to uh, withdraw and they will start stopping transactions because they will fear uh, uh, all the uh, like to be involved in uh, uh, facilitating funds for terrorist organization. It would be a base for illegal sue and. We are expecting that the pro-Israeli groups and the different groups that they could support the Israeli state in their position, they, they will start initiating such legal actions against international entities, international donors, or uh, banks in order to terrify them. At the end of the day, as you said, the main purpose here is to dry uh, our resources in order to silence them. Thank you. Brad, uh, how about you? What do you, what do you think, uh, in addition to what Sahar has brought us, what can you suggest we need to be doing? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the particular context is, is difficult because I think the, <laughs> there's, there's a lot we need to do, um, but the audiences that we need to act don't want to listen. So creating the, the, Certain momentum to force the change that we need, and and I think empower the organizations and and really a broader Palestinian rights movement, um, to be able to force change is is uh, what we've been focused on. Um, the, the the House Resolution 751 condemning the designations is a you know the goal of that was to create a vehicle that um, could channel organizing and 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 advocacy and activism um, to help boost numbers and explain and show the issue um, that we're facing with, with lawmakers in the US. Um, there's been similar efforts uh, in the UK and parliament and, and some other locations too, where, where um, lawmakers are stepping up to, to help with vehicles that, that will show that support. Um, and I think those efforts are, are really important um, to push back on kind of the broader narrative, right? I think what we're we're facing is that really anybody can be labeled a terrorist anywhere, um, 
to discredit them. Like we're seeing that increasingly throughout the global context. And, and this is a, you know, an example of that. Uh, I think it's also important um, in, in advocacy and in work around these de designations that it, it's integrated into a broader sort of strategy. Um, and it, as an example of Israeli authoritarian policies towards Palestinians, right? Um, this isn't sort of a one-off thing that's just kind of a bad luck for us. Um, this is part of what an Israeli government is that rules over Palestinians, denying them basic rights, um, not just in the occupied West Bank, but uh, throughout Israel as well. Um, so I think explaining that, showing that, and using it as an example of exactly what an Israeli authoritarian regime <laughs> would do, is doing, um, it, it, it helps really show the broader kind of picture of what Israeli policies are towards Palestinians. Um, and, and I think talking about it in that way and situating it as an example of that is, is something that gives it a trajectory in life, um, you know, whether we survive or not. <laughs> um, it, it, it's sort of piece of this broader picture that is important. Uh, and I think what will be the, the point of change. Um, mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you very much. That's wonderful. And Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that about what we need to be doing? You're yes, uh, become executive uh, director of one of the major organizations in the US now for Palestinian rights. So where do you uh, see it's going? I have three uh, letters for you, BDS. Uh, mm -hmm. International organizations, groups, individuals uh, must bring uh, nonviolent uh, pressure on Israel to respect human rights, to respect international law, to respect Palestinian lives. And I think we need to challenge the friends of Israel everywhere. Is this really what you, are, what you want to be? Is this really who you are? Uh, and if it's not, you either change your behavior or stop pretending you are in any way a democracy or an enlightened society or a, a respected member of the community of nations. Uh, unfortunately, this is the only thing that we can do and it's actually good. Uh, we need to use uh, pressure, uh, moral pressure, ethical pressure, political pressure, uh, and, and we need to start with friends of Israel everywhere we find them, uh, that this is not acceptable behavior. And, and you cannot uh, carry out this type of behavior uh, not just against these six organizations. As Brad says, this is part of a larger uh, mm -hmm. issue. Uh, is this going to be the, the, the nature of Israel for the future? Uh, have you accepted that you will be doing what you want and disregarding the international community? Do you accept your position as an apartheid regime that's oppressing another group? Uh, is this what you want to be for the rest of history, or do you want to change? And can you bring about change? And change is required. And, and Israel should not be allowed to have an easy, free uh, ability to continue with this oppression unchallenged. Fantastic. Jonathan, I'm gonna stick with you for a minute. Um, first of all, let me tell everyone we're, we're going to go a little bit past the hour, maybe 10 minutes past the hour. Um, and very quickly, we're going to get to at least a, a few of the questions that you all have been sending in to us. But um, <clears throat> we did want to look a little bit at what's happening to some others in Israel and Palestine uh, with this kind of lawfare assault. Uh, in particular, perhaps um, Mohammed El Halabi in yes. Gaza, the um, former director of World Vision's work in Gaza. Uh, they were bringing urgently needed humanitarian aid to uh, the two million people who are locked into Gaza because of the, the now 15 year long blockade of the Gaza Strip. Um, can you say a little bit about his case and, and what has happened to him and what, uh, what, the, what his status is now and what we might be able to do for him, if anything? In, in a way, this case is, is, is both unique and typical. 
Uh, it is unique because this one person decided that he is not going to take a plea. He is not going to give them the, the privilege of saying, I violated the law. I did not violate the law. I did not pass any money to Hamas. I did not uh, do any of these things that you are uh, claiming against me. And he did it in Israeli civilian court. This was not a military court. For 167 sessions, they have failed to bring to present any evidence. They kept referring to secret evidence that the lawyers themselves were not allowed to talk about. The, the, the lawyer who's from my office, Meher Hanna in, in, in Jerusalem, was not allowed even to prepare his summation on his own computer. He had to do it on the prosecutor's computer and to simply read it in court without even keeping a copy for himself. This is in a civilian court. He's been in jail for over five years when he could have been released from the first year if he had accepted a, a plea and if he had accepted responsibility for what he did not do. He says, I am not a terrorist. I did not pass any money to Hamas. Uh, this is all bogus. This is not true. And, and now they, they are stuck. They don't know what to do. Uh, they don't want to admit the, the mistake that they have done. Uh, they want to find him guilty, but there is no proof on which to find him guilty. Uh, the, the court ended four months ago, submitted the final summation four months ago. And now last week, the judges say, oh, your summation is too long. You need to contract it and reduce the number of pages. Uh, and you have to do it, of course, on the prosecutor's computer when the prosecutors are free to allow you to use their computer. Uh, and so I don't know what the judge will do in the end, uh, but, but this is a, 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 a really case of the utter lack of justice mm -hmm. in the Israeli justice system when it comes to issues pertaining to Palestinians. Uh, so we don't know what happens. Uh, we hope something good will come out of it, but, but we, our past experience has not been very good. There has been no proof. 165 sessions, no public evidence that can be shown to anybody. And the lawyer is not allowed to talk about whatever, how terrible the evidence there is uh, that, that was presented in secret. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I'm thinking it's a, a particularly intractable situation he's in for us to have an impact on. However, there is a, I just remembered a petition on change.org. Um, yes, I don't, I don't know. And you can say, Jonathan, I don't think it's officially put out there by, um, by FOSNA, but I happen to know it was a local FOSNA leader, at least to. Yes, FOSNA did this. start a petition and collected yeah. several thousand uh, Here it uh, is. signatures uh, on it. We had a campaign about it. I think we're going to probably revive the campaign. We were waiting for the decision of the court and uh -huh. now the decision is being pushed back even further. Uh, so we'll probably do some more uh, petition on, on behalf of Halabi. But remember, Halabi is only one. And in fact, he is unique because he's not under administrative detention. He's mm -hmm. under a regular court, not even a military court, a civilian court in Israel. But because he's a Palestinian and he's accused of something relating to security, uh, there, there is absolutely no justice uh, being provided to him. Mm -hmm. that, that petition is still on and we will be collecting more uh, and, and reviving the whole campaign on his behalf soon. Fantastic, thank you. All right, and I put the link for that petition in the chat for folks. Um, also a little farther up are some other resources um, that you all might like to look at. And I would particularly point out to you our page under find more resources. We're going to be adding more to that page after this webinar. Um, so we'll keep updating it about what's going on with the situation with the six organizations. Uh, I wanna move now to uh, some of the questions that we've been getting from people. And there are a lot of them, we're only gonna to get to a handful at best. Um, so I will ask 
you actually all have been doing very well on being succinct. I'll just ask you to continue that um, so we can cover as many questions as possible. Uh, this is something Brad touched on a little bit already. Um, a very good, very broad question. What implications might this have for human rights organizations in other countries and affiliated organizations? And I think maybe that means affiliated to you all, or you can interpret that as you like. What implications might this have for human rights organizations in other countries? Um, Sahar, do you have any thoughts about that? I think it would be like, as Brad was describing, if Israel claiming that it's the only democracy in the Middle East, and they allow themselves to designate six prominent Palestinian uh, organizations based on secret information without allowing due process. Can you imagine in like other states how they will react? And this is why the special rapporteur uh, uh, on the UN level was alerting that there is a misuse of the anti-terror laws in this case by Israel. And, and it could be used by other undemocratic states and authoritarian regimes, of course. And this is why we think that if you, if you allow such thing to pass, this is means it will be very easy used in other contexts, in other conflicts, in other wars against anyone almost in the world under the name of security based on secret information without allowing individuals or organizations to defend themselves. And of course, on the level of a, a, a partner organizations or any organization that works with us, it should be uh, clear that all the time that you are not present in Israel or in the occupied territories, Israel cannot implement their own law over you as an American in the United States now. So I don't think they can run after you as an uh, 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 American citizen sitting in the United States. I know there is loops and lots of, and this is what they will try to do all in the coming the, the more time pass, the more time they will discover the ways how to trace us and our supporters, I'm sure. But I mean, the first things would be used against the international organizations that are based here in the occupied territories or in East Jerusalem or inside Israel that they keep supporting us and working with us because it would be the easiest way how to attack uh, uh, supporters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that's very good. Brad, can you flesh that out a bit more? Do you see other implications in this for human rights uh, work and organizations in other parts of the world? And I think, you know, think coming from a more American perspective on the, the response or lack of response from the US government, Right, I think the the global impact of that, uh, you know, it, it, it sends a significant message. Um, you know, when the U.S. didn't come out uh, and condemn this move, you know, immediately or in the, the first few days, uh, you know, I think that sends a very strong message, uh, and, and you know, at least tacitly gives a green light to these same repressive tactics being replicated and. Um, you know, a number of different contexts where opposition groups or political actors can just be kind of labeled as terrorists and, you know, imprisoned, charged, um, or not charged, right, but removed from sort of the, the public sphere. Um, so I, I, I think there's already been trends um, where that's sort of increasing globally. Um, and, and I think the U.S. sort of role here in, in not condemning has a significant impact in, in sort of setting, you know, significant obstacles for the realization of human rights globally um, because of that lack of response uh, and condemnation sort of. So I think that's, that's you know, a really kind of big takeaway 
Um, and then I think on the more narrow level, the, the, the lack of a response one way or the other from the US government is, is, is troubling too. Um, and, and I think uh, creates a, a situation where um, if the evidence isn't strong enough from the US perspective to come out and be aligned with Israel on this, it gives an opportunity for Israel to create more evidence that would be amenable to the, the US government to come out and, and be aligned. So I think that's where you know, the, the real concern for escalation, for arrests, for interrogations, things like that become you know, a, a really clear next step um, if Israeli actors so choose. Um, and then I think on the, you know, thinking about partner groups in the U.S., again, as Sahar said, like the, the designation they're under Israeli law and now the military law. Um, so they are in, in many ways <laughs> firmly constricted to those jurisdictions. Um, however, we've, 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 you know, had people, American citizens, Palestinian Americans uh, that have been affiliated with the organizations um, at some point being stopped by Customs and Border Protection as they come through the U.S. in transit, being asked questions. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's not necessarily true that U.S. government has no position. Um, you know, if people are being stopped and interrogated at the airports, that's, that's something. Um, so it's trying to get a sense of, of what the, the sort of ramifications are on that front. But I think at the moment, um, there's no sort of prohibition or bar under US law that would prohibit anybody from engaging with the organizations. Um, you know, granted that could change if political decision by the, the Biden administration, you know, moves forward in one way or the other. But um, that's, that's, that's the context, I think, from my end. Thanks very much. And Jonathan, do you have a perspective on this the impact globally? Yes. Yes, I, I think, as, as Brad says, uh, the war against terrorism and the international cooperation in fighting terrorism and anti-terrorism legislation that exists in many countries is all now going to be weaponized to work against human rights and to work against civil society. Uh, if there's enough pushback, it won't happen or it won't happen right away. Uh, but they can also use the other uh, tool, which is the IHRA definition, so that if they can't actually criminalize you as a terrorist, they can label you as anti-Semitic, and you spend all your energy and resources fighting that charge and trying to prove uh, that, that you're not anti-Semitic, uh, rather than carry out uh, whatever uh, good uh, activities it, that you want to be carrying out. So it is in a, in a real way, it is a global fight. And, 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 and I say this as a person who has believed in human rights for a long time. Human rights are universal. International law needs to be applied across the board to everybody. You cannot carve out an exception for Palestinians. And, 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 and if you don't do that, then, then you are cheapening and reducing respect for human rights and for international law generally and ultimately for people's rights even in in the united states as we see with the anti-bds legislation that's that's being proposed here and there it is really actually weakening u.s laws and u.s freedoms and and, and u.s uh, mm -hmm. ability uh, to, to act as a civil society in order to safeguard what Israel wants. Thank you. Uh, someone else has asked about what's happening with the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Um, and the, the question says that several uh, Palestinian organizations, uh, let me see if I can get this right, are representing plaintiffs against Israeli officials mm -hmm. at the International Criminal Court. This is clearly a threat to Israel. How are the cases before the ICC proceeding also, are Adamir and DCI Palestine lawyers still able to access Palestinians imprisoned by Israel? We heard a little bit about that. Um, that's two very different questions. How are the any ICC cases you know of progressing, I'll, and how are your own attorneys uh, faring? I'll start on the ICC. Uh, I think Israel and the United States are both pressuring the ICC 
to go slow and not to uh, proceed with these actions. In fact, the ICC is going much slower uh, than people would like. Uh, the United States has made it clear that it is going to, at least under the previous administration, uh, that it would punish those who bring those actions at the ICC, would even punish the prosecutors and the judges. It would, would prohibit them from getting visas into the United States, may even arrest them, uh, may even uh, freeze their bank accounts. So uh, there is a real attempt to silence uh, the, the International Criminal Court itself if it proceeds as it is proceeding, although slowly, uh, to move against uh, Israel. Uh, I'll let Sahar answer because on, on, on the lawyers, uh, which I understand uh, the answer that she gave already, I think is satisfactory. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think I already explained that in both our cases, DCI and the Dabir, lawyers can do represent uh, detainees uh, under their capacity as private lawyers, and they do so. So they couldn't be banned from being uh, present in the court or in the uh, doing the visitation in the prison uh, because they will do it as individuals, as, as private lawyers, not as representatives of these two organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. You know what, we're at eight minutes, almost nine minutes past the hour now. So I think we are gonna need to wrap this up and I'm sorry we couldn't get to more questions from our audience, but actually, as I was looking through them, it seemed like uh, a number of them did get answered along the way. So I hope uh, many people heard the answers that they wanted to know. Uh, one thing that was mentioned was if, if there is any place where there is a collection of a, all church statements or faith-based organizational statements about this. Um, we are collecting those and you'll be able to find them at that same resources page for this issue, Stand With The Six, uh, on the UMKR website. Uh, so keep checking back on that page. Um, yeah, I think that's it for us now. And I am just um, so grateful to the three of you for giving us all this time and staying even past the hour you, uh, I think I've helped a, a lot of people understand better what's happening there and um, motivated us to, to stay the course and not forget about this issue and realize that um, as Jonathan and others pointed out, there's gonna be more to come and Israel isn't going to let this drop. We need to be vigilant and keep supporting you. So we will not let this die at UMKR. Thank you so much, Sahar and Brad and Jonathan. I'm gonna pass this back now to Bridget Cabrera, who can tell us about the next webinar we have coming up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to drop a couple links in the chat um, for the next webinar, um, the Doctrine of Discovery webinar that we have going on with UMKR and NIAC. Um, we'll be having our fourth um, um, webinar in that series next month. Um, the information's in the chat. It's on uh, February 9th, and we'll be um, focusing on um, the theme. I can move my cursor here and look at it. The theme centering and othering, um, elevating white normativity and suppressing racial and indigenous identities, how the doctrine of discovery has perpetuated um, those themes. Um, what that looks like today. And so I really hope you can join us. Um, and I know that we will also be having another webinar with UMKR in March. So be on the lookout for more information on that. Thank you, everyone.